opportunity to introduce my dear colleague and friends, uh, Dr. Nagla El Kabbani. Dr. Nagla is a consultant of endocrinology uh, in Shams University. She will speak about the postpartum uh, uh, thyroiditis with pregnancy. Go on, Nagla. Okay, uh, first of all, I like to thank uh, my dear friend uh, and uh, one of the eminent uh, endocrinology professors in Alexandria University, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Alia El Aguri. She allowed me to participate in such uh, a very nice event, educational and international event. Uh, my talk today is going to be on uh, the postpartum hyperthyroid dilemma. Next. Uh, let us start by a successful pregnancy. In fact, a successful pregnancy presents an immunological challenge for the maternal immune system. And that's because the maternal immune system next is faced by, next, yes, is faced by two things. No, return back, May, please. Uh, it's faced by two things. Uh, the immune system of the mother has to uh, protect the mother and the fetus against foreign pathogens, and not that only, but more important to uh, form a tolerance for the paternal allo antigens, the father allo antigens. Uh, so simply the mother will not reject the fetus. This is a successful pregnancy. Next, postpartum period is an immunologically peculiar period in the woman's life. Really, it is uh, a period which didn't take uh, enough attention. A uh, little amount, a little number of studies, uh, a little investigation, even the studies that uh, shed light on this period was of a little number of population that uh, engaged in such studies. Next, postpartum uh, period, immunologically is characterized by a rebound. Rebound from the pregnancy, profound changes that happen for the aim to protect the fetus and the mother to the normal condition before pregnancy. Next. Although most of the pregnancy induced thyroid immune changes gradually return to normal, along the 12 months after delivery, which is the postpartum period, still we are encountered by exacerbation or new onset of some of the thyroid or even other uh, autoimmune diseases that not only, they, as we are saying, that occurs for the first time, but also it can be an exacerbation of already present during pregnancy. Uh, some of these, uh, uh, the topic of this uh, lecture next is uh, the cytotoxicosis that occurs in this uh, very peculiar period, which is the postpartum period. Next, cytotoxicosis in postpartum is either a postpartum thyroiditis, that is the large number of patients presenting in this period is with postpartum thyroiditis, or to a lesser extent is Graves disease. And that is opposite to what happens in pregnancy where Graves disease comes first, followed by the transient gestational uh, hyperthyroid that Professor, Dr. Professor uh, Tamer is going to talk to you about. Next, we are going to start talking first about the postpartum Graves disease. Next, really again, it was not fully studied. The number of studies are very small. The, the most uh, countries that have shed light on graves with the postpartum period were Italy and uh, Japan. We have uh, two forms of uh, graves disease in the postpartum period. We either encountered by a de novo, the, the uh, woman will have graves disease for the first time in her, uh, without being uh, graves during pregnancy, or it may be a relapse of an already present Graves during pregnancy. Next, speaking about the Nobu, the Nobu period shed, uh, I'll put a question, is the postpartum a high risk moment for the Nobu occurrence of uh, uh, Graves disease? 
uh, there is a large discrepancy between studies. If we go to the old studies, we'll find that they are saying that about 45% of Graves' disease in the postpartum period are occurring for the first time. This puts an important point that maybe postpartum uh, period carries by itself immunological changes that precipitate to graves. On the other side, recent studies really uh, gave us a completely different uh, message. It said this is an overestimated number. We have graves disease in postpartum occurring for the first time does not exceed 10%. And again, this says that postpartum period is only a risk for a patient that is already genetically determined to occur Graves' disease. Next. The other condition is uh, the other cause of Graves' disease in the postpartum period is the excess uh, is the relapse of Graves' disease that had remitted during pregnancy. Let us start saying that uh, uh, cyanamides, the anti drugs, uh, whether they are mesimazole or bromyl cyuracil, both of them are very uh, successful in treating Graves' disease, getting us from hyperthyroid state to eusyroid state still. This continuation of these drugs, even in non-pregnant female, was always associated by a high risk of uh, relapse, that some studies say it reaches 60% relapse. Uh, so uh, what happens in pregnancy really is amelioration and uh, even uh, remission of Graves' disease. If the female getting into pregnancy with Graves, uh, pregnancy will, and I think uh, uh, Professor Dr. Alia will speak about it. She, she's going to speak more about that. Uh, so uh, ex especially at the third trimester, there is a about 20 to 30 percent remission rate. This will motivate and uh, um, uh, uh, as we can say, it will make most of the physicians who are putting in their mind the welfare of the fetus, they are going to stop and discontinue this, uh, these anti thyroid drugs. Next, in a Japanese study, they found that the females that had a remission during pregnancy of Graves' disease and continued their anti thyroid drugs, they were associated with a lower risk of acquiring the relapse of uh, L. Graves' disease in the postpartum period. And in reality, this does not happen. This does not happen even with gynecologists, even with endocrinologists who are uh, looking at the uh, benefit of the fetus and needing to protect the fetus. So they rush once they, uh, uh, or they are intimated, uh, they are motivated to stop the anti thyroid drugs. Next. This, these studies had changed the uh, American Thyroid Association guidelines uh, from uh, 2012. In 2017, they have recommended that the females, the women that had a remission during pregnancy from Graves, has to be followed up with the thyroid function in the postpartum period. Next. These are the uh, well-known uh, symptoms of Graves in a woman. We are uh, uh, stressing on certain things that may happen in the postpartum period, and that is especially the volume of milk in the breast lactating women. There is a decrease in the volume of L breast milk, and there is a little bit of hair loss. The female may come with a fatigue, palpitation, uh, some of uh, very importantly, depression, anxiety, or uh, mood swing and the other manifestation of graves. Next. How to manage uh, uh, graves in the postpartum period? Usually we are going to use the anti thyroid drugs. Let us uh, agree first that both of them passes through the breast milk. If we, uh, we look to the past ideas, to the old ideas, we'll find that uh, physicians usually discourage the female who are breastfeeding to uh, continue their breastfeeding while they are using an anti-thyroid drugs. 
This is completely changed in the recent uh, attitude where doctors nowadays are uh, encouraging their uh, patients to continue antithyroid drugs while they are breast, they are encouraging them to continue breastfeeding uh, while they are treated with the antithyroid drugs. And that's because the studies which, uh, that had been made on the antithyroid, whether they are bovine tyrosine or methimazole, both of them didn't cause any, uh, uh, um, didn't cause um, uh, adverse events or even hypothyroid to the fetus in the low and model, model, uh, moderate doses. Next. Uh, if we see, if we compare between methimazole and bovine cyrocele, we'll find that uh, methimazole um, is four to seven times higher proportion that is transferred into the maternal milk. And if we say so, uh, everyone is going to think uh, that uh, that makes us prefer bovine cyrocele during this period, which is not the case because. Uh, all the guidelines had put both of them at the same uh, level. And that's, uh, I think, because uh, the, uh, back in our mind, we have to think about the effect of bovine cyrocele and its risk for hepatotoxicity for the mother. All the guidelines found that it is better next. Uh, the, the latest guidelines, 2017, the American Thyroid Association, the ATA, and the European Thyroid Association, 2018, both of them agreed on the lowest effective next, the lowest effective dose of any, uh, uh, any of them can be used. Both of them agreed on the dose, the maximum dose of methimazole, and that does not exceed 20 milligram per day, while they disagreed on the dose of robile cyrocele. Uh, European Thyroid Association uh, said that the maximum dose can be uh, not more than 250 milligram per day, but the American, the ATA, uh, really it's a daring, uh, daring, more daring, uh, and uh, not only that uh, the uh, level increased to 300, but the latest one, uh, it, it was 450, up to 450. And I think that's because the probile thyroseal passage through the breast milk is not that much. Next. Finally, both of them uh, uh, agreed on the fact that uh, uh, if you use any of uh, the two drugs, you have to use them in a fractionated dose and after a breastfeeding. Next. Now we are going to speak about the most common presentation of cytotoxicosis during the postpartum period, and that's the postpartum thyroiditis. Next. Postpartum thyroiditis is called also the destructive thyroiditis. It is associated with lymphocytic infiltration and it occurs in the first year after delivery in women without any history of thyroid disease prior to pregnancy. Histologically, it is very similar to Hashimoto thyroiditis. And if we look, we will find that both of them uh, are similar, uh, are, uh, associ are associated with HLA. D and HLA-B halotypes indicating the importance of inherited risk factors. Next. The epidemiology of postpartum thyroiditis is very strange. The incidence usually, we, if we are speaking about incidence, we say from two to four, for example, from five to 10. But uh, as you can see in front of you, the incidence is from 1.1 to 16.7. It's a very big uh, difference between the two. And that is uh, attributed to the fact that uh, the uh, iodine intake in different countries and genetic factors. For example, a country like, again, Brazil, uh, the Brazil uh, has a higher incidence of postpartum thyroiditis, 13.3, while a country like Thailand uh, the incidence does not exceed 1.1. Uh, WHO, World Health Organization, said that a country like Pakistan, uh, 
Uzbekistan carries a very high incidence. Maybe this is higher incidence, 16.7. And uh, it was due to the fact that uh, there is a lot of uh, iodine deficiency there. Uh, United States of America has an average of 5 to 10 of uh, percentage of the pregnancy. And again, this uh, uh, high dif the, this big difference is attributed to the two factors, the genetic factors and the iodine intake in these countries. Next, why does some women have postpartum thyroiditis after their pregnancy and others don't have? There are risk factors, the most important of which is uh, the presence of type 1 diabetes mellitus that uh, rises the risk up to 19.1. And then the family history of not only postpartum thyroiditis, but of any thyroid dysfunction rises the risk up to 20%. Then comes the previous history of postpartum thyroiditis in any female that uh, increases her risk to 42.4%. The uh, estimation of uh, the uh, TPO, uh, women that remains positive to TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, uh, until their third trimester, uh, this will rise the, uh, 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 the risk up to 80%. And that's why the recommendation next of screening the women that are high risk for uh, acquiring postpartum thyroiditis with the TPO, and if it is positive, uh, it is recommended to follow up these females third months of, uh, uh, after pregnancy and at the six months after delivery, Se third, uh, uh, third months after delivery in the postpartum period and six months uh, postpartum. Next. Clinically, uh, the, there are three presentations for postpartum thyroiditis, either a transient uh, hyperthyroidism, and that is about 32% of our patient, transient hypo, 43% of our patient, and the classic uh, uh, transient hypo followed by transient hyper and then recovery, and that is only 25% of the cases. Clinically, next, uh, it is a painless uh, condition. It's not only painless uh, goiter lacking, but also the symptoms are mild, uh, and I'm speaking about the cytotoxic phase. The cytotoxic phase is mild and usually and often it is uh, uh, underdiagnosed and uh, goes on to the uh, transient hypo without being diagnosed. And uh, uh, so it is mild and transient. Next. With a characteristic, if there are symptoms, the most in, uh, common presentation and symptoms of the female are a painless goiter, loss of hair, fatigue, and uh, as you can see, the very important, again, mood uh, changes, depression, anxiety, mood swings, and the lowering of the volume of the breast uh, milk in the breastfeeding woman. Next. How to manage? Really, we are screening and we are knowing that there is a lot of females are at risk of developing postpartum thyroiditis, but uh, many uh, trials had been made in order to prevent it, sometimes uh, uh, giving uh, um, uh, 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 levothyroxine. Uh, in one study, they used selenium, but still it is a non, till now it is non uh, preventable disease. Next. The hyperthyroid phase is uh, uh, usually does not need any treatment because it is, as we said, transient and mild. And uh, uh, if the symptoms are severe, we can use beta blockers, propranolol, metoprononol. These are safe and in small doses in order not to affect the fetus, uh, the, uh, the baby, the infant. Next. This is a picture of uh, the whole phases of uh, the postpartum thyroiditis, uh, the starting with the transient cytotoxicosis, then the transient hypothyroid. As you can see, these are transient phases, do not uh, last except uh, for about two to four months, and then the recovery phase. 
uh, during which we have uh, the cytotoxic phase, we have the elevation of the thyroid hormones and the TSH is lowered, then followed by elevation of TSH and lowering of the thyroid hormones and then the recovery. Along the whole uh, uh, phases, we will have the uh, TPO antibodies uh, are elevated and we have the thyroglobin uh, also is elevated. Uh, in, uh, if we, uh, if the, uh, they are doing a radio iodine scanning, we will have el the lowering during the toxic phase and then the elevation in the hypothyroid and then returning and recovery to normal. The treatment, uh, no treatment except beta blocker in cytotoxic phase, the hypothyroid will give the levothyroxine and then the recovery. Next. This is very important. Uh, uh, the differential diagnosis uh, between the two cases, the Graves disease and the postpartum thyroiditis, and the importance of which uh, for a better management. Because as you have seen, we have to give a full treatment uh, for uh, the uh, Graves disease, while postpartum thyroiditis does not need any treatment. Next, starting with the manifestation. Clinically, as we said before, Graves has the full picture of uh, uh, symptoms and signs, while postpartum thyroiditis is mild, uh, very mild symptoms, and usually no extra thyroidal manifestations. Timing of onset is very important. Timing of onset in uh, postpartum thyroiditis, it starts in the first to third, and some studies said that from the second to the fourth months after delivery, while Graves disease does not occur, whether it is a relapse or de novo, except after six months from delivery. The transient occurrence of the symptoms, if there are a hyperthyroid, you, uh, thyrotoxicosis is transient, does not last uh, except for about uh, two to four months, while Graves disease is of a longer period of symptoms and signs. Then the ratio between the free T3 to T4, uh, free T4 is higher in Graves disease. But these are only aiding the tools for differential diagnosis. The main differential diagnosis next is, uh, was first, let us speak about was and not uh, is, uh, was the scanning, thyroid scanning. They used to, in the old days, to stop lactation and to use the iodine-131, and so they ha have to ban the, uh, breastfeeding and the female has to uh, be away from her baby. But uh, recently, they use the short half-life uh, iodine-132 uh, uh, for three to two, uh, two to three days, but, uh, or technetium, which only uh, have a half-life of 24 hours, still, <coughs> These uh, are not to be used except if we have failed to differentiate with the other tools, which are the most recently, uh, we depend on them, the TRAP assay and the ultrasound, uh, thyroid ultrasound. The TRAP assay is the evaluation of the TSH receptor antibodies, which are elevated in the Graves disease. And the, uh, um, I think the uh, great uh, improvement and the, the great uh, results of ultrasound had given us a tool which is, does not uh, uh, affect the mother or the fetus like L-thyroid scanning. Uh, ultrasound can uh, differentiate between them by the inter uh, intrathyroid blood flow which is elevated in Graves and is uh, decreased in the postpartum thyroiditis. And even the volume of the thyroid itself, usually in Graves, uh, uh, there is a big volume. And the, uh, in the uh, thyroiditis, it is a smaller one, but mainly by the blood flow. Next. Prognosis and follow-up. Uh, um, Postpartum thyroiditis belong to a group of diseases known as the resolving thyroiditis. 
And uh, usually uh, the, uh, the phases, the classical form, it uh, comes to a recovery and uh, only about 20% of the cases are going to uh, suffer from a permanent hypothyroidism. And that's why the recommendation of uh, the ATA uh, uh, 2017 had recommended that we follow up the patients that have postpartum thyroiditis annually. Every year, we have to follow them for five to 10 years with the uh, TSH evaluation. Uh, thank you very much for your kind, uh, uh, kind listening. And uh, I have uh, uh, questions. I have uh, chosen three questions, really. They are very good questions. Uh, first question saying that, uh, is there a relation between the level of TPO uh, antibodies and uh, uh, the postpartum thyroiditis presentation? Yes, uh, if the TPO uh, level is high, the um, uh, uh, postpartum thyroiditis presentation is severe. The symptoms are severe and the presentation is severe. One of the most important questions, again, I, I am and I'm thankful for the one who had asked this question, is about what about uh, depression in both cases, uh, the uh, postpartum thyroiditis and Graves' disease. Uh, this is very important. And the ATA had recommended that any female that is complaining of, of uh, postpartum depression anxiety or even uh, mood swing has to be evaluated for her situation because we don't rush to psychiatric uh, evaluation, but uh, uh, first ev uh, evaluate and perform her thyroid function. The last question really is a very important uh, question also, and that is the role of iodine in, uh, um, in both cases in cytotoxicosis in this period. Really, iodine, uh, iodine, is, uh, uh, iodine deficiency, as you have seen, is a risk for acquiring uh, postpartum thyroiditis. The supplementation of uh, iodine in pregnancy uh, was a, uh, a debate. Do we continue in the postpartum period if the female has a Graves disease or postpartum thyroiditis? Recently, they are encouraging the continuation of uh, the iodine supplement in a dose that does not exceed 250 microgram per day. And uh, uh, they said that uh, most of the studies uh, said that this iodine will not uh, have any impact on the maternal hyperthyroid state. Uh, still, all the researchers uh, um, regarding iodine especially are asking and they agreed that we need more studies more studies with a large number of populations so that we can really uh, say what is the right dose and the right time to give iodine. And again, I thank you very much. And uh, uh, I thank you for your kind listening and attendance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Nagla. Really, it was uh, a great uh, presentation. And all audience, thank you for this presentation. And uh, we have two questions. The first one is Indral is safe in lactation? Yes, I said that uh, Indral is propranolol and it is uh, safe in uh, the smallest against those uh, as much as possible, but it is safe, uh, you can give it in lactation, yes. Okay, the second question, if patient symptoms not controlled with beta blocker, can we give antithyroid drugs and which one? Yes, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, usually it is not recommended to use antithyroid drugs because the mechanism already, the thyroid during thyroiditis is shutting down. There is no increase in the production. But I ran into a, a number of studies that were recommending the use of probiothyroxine because it decreased the peripheral change of T4 into T3, uh, but uh, I think it is not uh, uh, guidelines. They don't recommend that, okay? Okay, thank you, dear Nagla. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Uh, 